Thank you for joining us for another great service at First and LR. I'm honored that you have set aside part of your week to be with us. If you enjoy watching the service, you'll love it even more in person. We would love for you to come and spend a weekend in a service with us and introduce yourself in the guest center. You can learn more about service times and other ways to connect at firstnlr.com. I'm praying that today's message speaks to you and I'm believing for God to do marvelous things in your life. Thanks for watching. We've also been, been introduced to terms like fake news, altered reality, an alternate set of facts, alternate truth, my truth. You hear those phrases from politicians and celebrities on social media and cable news networks. They're all new ways to say, it's not really true, it's a lie. In the old days, you could count on the news telling you the truth. Now you start with the assumption that what you see on TV or online isn't true. In fact, if you depend solely on one news outlet for your information about the world, you're getting a slanted version of reality, otherwise known as a lie. I wanna look at a few of the many Bible verses that talk about lying. Proverbs 19.5, a false witness will not go unpunished. He who pours out lies will not go free. 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love does not delight in evil, but love rejoices with the truth. In the South, we often excuse lying by saying, oh, don't pay any attention to that. That's just an. Like certain people are somehow exempt from the ninth commandment. But in Exodus chapter 20, God said, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. That commandment is most commonly expressed as, don't lie. According to dictionary.com, a lie is a false statement made with deliberate attempt to deceive. An intentional untruth, a falsehood, something intended or serving to convey a false impression. There are different types of lies. According to researchers, the most common lies Americans tell are what we call white lies. When someone says, how are you? The standard answer is, I'm fine. 92% of people confess to telling that lie, saying they're fine when they're not. 80% of people admitted saying, I love this present when they didn't. 78% of people confess to falsely claiming, I'm sick. And probably 99.5% of students have made that claim. A white lie is still a lie. A broken promise when you don't keep your commitment to people or to God is a lie. Broken promises lead to broken relationships, broken trust, and broken lies. If you give your word, keep it. An exaggeration enhances the truth with lies. People mix truth with untruth to make a story better or more impressive. The challenge with an exaggeration is that someone else might repeat it as truth. Your exaggeration makes them a liar. I tell our team, don't tell me you had 100 people if you had 90. I want real numbers. I want facts. A deception is when you cause someone to believe something that isn't true. You might not actually speak a lie, but you cleverly lead them to believe a lie. If your words cause someone to believe something other than the truth, it's a lie. A bold-faced lie is a lie everyone knows is a lie. I've had people tell crazy bold-faced lies about me. I listen, I think, there's no way anyone will believe that. But they tell it until someone does. The thought seems to be if you tell a lie often enough, people will believe it's true. Here are a couple of the craziest ones about me. Uh, he flies a helicopter everywhere he goes. <laughs> I would love to fly a helicopter everywhere I go, but there's not place to land at Chick-fil-A, Hog, or my house. He has 24-7 security. That would be awesome, especially if it came with a driver. 
not to protect me from others, but to protect others from my driving. That'd be great. <laughs> Borrowing a story is telling someone else's story as your own. Years ago, I was speaking at an event, and right before I got up, my host leaned over and said, hey, by the way, don't tell your tornado story because I already told it. I said, wait a second, you told my story about me without me here? He said, well, sorry, man, I, I told it like it happened to me. That's a lie. A half-truth is when you tell someone part of the truth, but not all of it. A half-truth is a whole lie. Then there are technical truths. When you find a technicality, so you can say you didn't lie. For instance, you'll ask, hey, did you know about that? Uh, well, that's the first time I ever saw that piece of paper. I've never spent a dollar on that. True, you spent $10. I'm on my way. You just got out of bed and you're technically moving. Every parent has experienced this one. You call out, what are you doing? And then there's a real long pause and then my homework. Sorry, I'm running late, I got caught in traffic. There were four cars at the stoplight when you were already 15 minutes late. I didn't have a drink. You had three. Would you email me that? Uh, sure, uh, I'm almost done working on it. In other words, I forgot and I'm starting right now. Technical truths that cause someone to believe something other than the truth are a lie. Colossians chapter three, Paul challenged believers to leave behind their old life and everything associated with it. He wrote to the church in Colossae, put to death therefore whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. You have a new nature because Jesus is Lord of your life. When you lie, you return to old practices associated with your old life and you act like the sinner you once were. Don't go back. Jesus said about Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. The devil is the father of lies. When you lie, you speak Satan's language. You're acting like the devil's child, not God's. Honesty and truth is of God. Lying deceit is of the devil. Lying misrepresents and dishonors God. And finally, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Paul said to get rid of lies, speak truth, because we're members of one body. Lying is like a paper cut. A tiny little paper cut makes the manliest man act like a wimp. But pretty quick, the pain from the cut goes away and you forget all about it. That's why you often dismiss the sin of lying, because it hurts at first, but then people forget and get over it. However, because we're one body, the body of Christ, tiny little lies affect all of us. Tiny lies have big consequences in the kingdom. Lying brings harm to the body of Christ. I often ask, questions I know the answer to just to see if someone will tell me the truth. And their dishonest answer lets me know I can't trust them. Lying destroys trust. Trust is broken for years, sometimes for a lifetime. Lies may be forgiven and should be forgiven, but they are rarely forgotten. 
Once you've established yourself as a liar, you will always be investigated to determine if you're telling the truth. And then finally, Revelation chapter 22 gives the worst consequence of lying. I'm reading this straight from the Bible. He said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God. He will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. If you look at that list, Liars are included with murderers, idolaters, and the sexually immoral as those who won't be in heaven. This is a big deal. When you lie, you risk hell. So with so much on the line, why do people lie? I don't know all the reasons. I can think of a few. Some people lie because of fear. They're afraid of losing a relationship or a job or trust. They fear the consequences of the truth more than they fear the consequences of the lie. Others lie because of pride. They don't want people to know their mistakes or faults or want others to see their victories as bigger than they really are. Some, some lies are to cover up mistakes. They're embarrassed about something stupid they did so they lie to hide it. And the problem is when the cover up is revealed, it's often worse than the original mistake. Other lies are born of greed. Online scams, fake fundraisers, pyramid schemes are all lies designed to make the liar rich. You lie when buying or selling a car so you can get a better deal. You justify it by saying, well, it's just part of the game. Everyone does that. You lie on your taxes because you're greedy. Insecurity leads to lies. You're afraid if people know the real you, they won't like you or include you, so you lie to make yourself look better. Others lie to hide addiction, to avoid consequences, to manage their image. Still others lie to hurt. Their goal is to inflict pain or to turn people against the target of their lives. Social media allows those lies to reach further faster. It's closely related to gossip, an ugly sin that it hurts the church. And then some people lie just to see if they can get people to believe it. For them, it's a game. They make up crazy stuff to see how many people they can fool. So I want to help you today. All right? Regardless of what you read online, Disney is not giving away free tickets. It doesn't matter how many times you post it or what you sing, they're not going to give you a free ticket. In fact, they're going to raise the price. Facebook does not have a new algorithm restricting what you see to only 26 people. I can't tell you how many fall for that, even when all you have to do to prove it wrong is scroll down. Texas Roadhouse is not giving away $100 gift cards no matter how many times you post. Mark Zuckerberg is not taking down the Lord's Prayer or using your pictures. Why in the world would Facebook want a picture of you and your cat? And if you post telling Mark Zuckerberg he can't use your pictures, that accomplishes nothing because Mark Zuckerberg is not reading your posts. He has better things to do than read your posts about the latest crazy scam. And by the way, when you post pictures, you are posting them on a public site for everyone to see. If you don't want people to see your pictures, don't post your pictures. The person on the phone has no idea what's happening with your car's extended warranty. I'm never going to ask you to buy gift cards. If I need gift cards, I will just take them out of Cindy's purse. I don't need your help. (laughs) Regardless of the reason or the excuse, lying is a sin. 
As followers of Jesus, we're called to be different. Now I want to look at the other side of the equation. I want to look at the rewards and benefits when you tell the truth. When you tell the truth, you don't have to worry about being discovered or found out. You don't have to remember what you said or who you said it to. It can be hard to keep up with what lie you told what person, but the truth stands for itself. When you lie, uh, you're plagued with guilt. When you tell the truth, your conscience is clear. You can lay your head on the pillow knowing you've done right before others and right before God. When you tell the truth, you promote unity. Unity is built on trust. Trust is established by truth. When we trust each other, we're able to stand against Satan's deceptions and schemes. We are stronger together because of truth. Now, here's the sad part of truth telling. If you tell the truth, even in the right spirit with the right motive, you'll still have enemies because truth divides. Not everyone wants to hear or acknowledge truth. Tell the truth anyway. Truth, every soul matters to God. Truth. As a church, according to Scripture, our priority must be to reach people who don't have a relationship with Jesus. Truth. There can be no prejudice in the body of Christ. I've had people decide I was the enemy because of that truth. But God has called us to reach all kinds of people, all ages, all races, all economic classes, all backgrounds. That is a very clear truth in Scripture and a very clear truth for our church. That truth forces a decision. You can decide, I will put aside my preferences and prejudices and embrace the whole body of Christ. Or you can decide, I don't believe that. I reject the teachings of Jesus and the truth that every soul matters to God. I'm going to find a place where everyone's just like me. You can decide, I'm not going to worship with those kind of people. See, Pastor Rod, no one would say that to you. They did, they have, and they left. But their stubborn, sinful ignorance doesn't change truth. All truths divide because truth forces a decision. It's a line in the sand. You decide whether or not to accept the truth, believe the truth, and act the truth. Ephesians 4.15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. That is Christ. So I want to talk a few minutes about this. Speaking the truth in love. That is an often neglected practice in the church. We avoid truth for fear of hurting feelings or losing a relationship. But God called us to be truth tellers. And this is not, this is awesome. I can't wait to go tell some truth. That's a typical reaction to think about telling truth instead of hearing truth. Before you do that, let me challenge you. We need to love each other to tell the truth, but we need some principles to guide that. Truth-telling should be motivated by love, not anger. Really, it's easier to avoid telling someone hard truths and opt out of difficult conversations. But love compels you to action, to care enough to sit down face to face and say, I'm concerned about you. I see something that worries me. I'm determined to have difficult, truthful conversations in an atmosphere of love in order to build others up. But here's a good principle. If you can't share the truth in love, you're the wrong one to share it. Pastor friend called me. He was mad. Ticked off. Some people in his church had said and written mean things. He said, Rod, I'm done. I'm going to handle this once and for all. I'm going after them this time. I'm going to solve it. I listened, I sympathized, I understand the emotion, it's not fair. But then when he was all done, I said, now, is, is that going to be a loving conversation? Because if you have the conversation in anger and you don't say it with love in your heart, it's probably not the right time to say it. I'm fine with you talking to them when you can do it in love. Maybe you've heard someone say, well, I just tell it like it is. Right before they 
light into some of their angry opinions and vicious words. That is not a unity promoting body of Christ building truth teller. That is a jerk who uses a twisted version of truth as a weapon to intimidate. Those kind of people have no place in the church. If you're excited about confronting someone with the church, with the truth, you're the wrong person to do it. You need to keep your thoughts to yourself until you've developed character through the Holy Spirit that allows you to speak truth in a loving, redemptive way. The goal of truth telling is to redeem and restore, not condemn and punish and get even. The truth teller genuinely wants the hearer to grow and to accomplish God's purpose. The aim isn't to hurt, cause pain, or punish. If your goal is not redemptive, then you shouldn't be the one to confront. You should stay quiet. I love email and texts, social media. Well, I don't love social media. Uh, but regardless, truth should be told in person, face to face. People who try to be truth tellers in emails rarely are effective at communicating the spirit of love. Instead, they're sitting behind their computer late at night, pounding on the keyboard, spewing out anger. If you have the thought, I'm going to send an email and tell him how it is, you're probably not being used by God. Don't confront over email. You need to see the other person. You need to see how they react. And they need to see love in your eyes, concern in your expression. Truth-telling happens best in the context of trusting relationships. If you know I love you and have your best interests at heart, you're more willing to hear truth. And I've learned that many times I need to wait and prove my love before I have the conversation. Truth-telling should always be preceded by prayer. Godly truth-tellers think and pray in advance. They agonize over how they'll say it. They pray about how the other person will respond. Most of the time, they dread the conversation, but they're relationally invested enough to follow through. I have never met someone who loves confrontation and is actually good at it. Pray before you share, because truth-telling is a huge risk. Difficult conversations don't always go well. I've had instances where I knew telling the truth might cost a friendship. I've had times I knew it could result in someone leaving the church. I've lost relationships because I told the truth, cared enough to step in and make a difference. And I've cried a lot of tears over it. I've talked to people about addictions and affairs and flaws. I knew going in it wasn't going to be easy or fun. So when I need to have a painful talk, I pray. I pray God let let what I say be received in the right spirit, but let my words be laced with love and compassion. Reveal to me if my motive is wrong in any way. Show me how to communicate truth in a way that pleases you. Even though it's scary and it can go wrong, love others enough to tell the truth. If you don't, you are an enabler. Enabler convinces himself that by helping you avoid truth, he's showing you acceptance, forgiveness, and love. Enable, an enabler might even say truth tellers are against you. I've spent a lot of time with ministers who've fallen and failed. It's heartbreaking. Most of the time, they didn't have a truth teller in their life. Or someone tried, but was rejected. Students, listen to me. Look at me. Keep truth tellers in your life who love you and have your best interests at heart. Don't make them the enemy. If you get mad at them for telling the truth, go apologize and say, hey, sometimes I get my feelings hurt, but I, I know you love me and I need to hear truth. Keep telling me that. I need to keep growing. I've sat with people and said, you just can't keep doing that. It's sin. And if you continue on this path, you will destroy your family. You'll destroy your life. Some people are so unwilling to hear acknowledge the truth. They decide anyone who would dare disagree with their fantasy is an enemy. And it's a sad thing when you become someone's enemy by telling the truth. The question is, is it worth avoiding it to remain their friend? And if you do that, are you really their friend? 
If you really love someone, you'll share difficult truths. It's, it's been years ago. I was at a conference with a group of people from our church, and we all went out to eat between sessions. And while we were eating, I have no idea how it happened, but one of the guys got a big dollop of mashed potatoes right there on his forehead. I don't know how you do that. I mean, it's pretty tough to do, but he had mashed potatoes right here. And I decided to just watch and see what would happen. <laughs> he's sitting at the table. He's all talking and having fun. He's thinking people are laughing at his jokes. And people are laughing at mashed potatoes on his face. And no one told him. After a while, he went to the restroom. When he came back, he said, how come no one told me I had mashed potatoes on my face? Someone needs to love you enough to say, hey, dude, you got mashed potatoes on your forehead. <laughs> if you know I love you and have your best interests at heart, you know I'll be truthful with you. If I'm really your friend, I have to be willing to risk it all to stay, save you from tough consequences and eternal judgment. Psalm 27.5 says, it is better to correct someone openly than to have love and not show it. The slap of a friend can be trusted to help you. The kisses of an enemy are nothing but lies. Maybe you're struggling with someone who has expressed concern or confronted a sin or an attitude. Students, you might be angry at your class pastor or your youth pastor for confronting you. Adults, you might be mad at Pastor Lane or your sponsor in Forever Free for addressing an issue. Know this, if you make truth tellers the enemy, you'll be blind to the truth. You will eliminate your best source of honest feedback and godly correction. You need someone in your life who loves you enough to confront you when you're headed in the wrong direction. Someone who cares enough about you to express concern over your decisions. Someone committed enough to say, I see something that concerns me. Someone willing to say that sin, and it will have horrible consequences. You've got to make that right. Often the truth does hurt. Not knowing the truth hurts much, much more. Love tells the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love not only tells the truth, love rejoices in the truth. Maybe. What an incredible service. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our church family. If you have any questions about today's service, if you need prayer, or if you just want to learn more about First NLR, go to firstnlr.com or follow us on social media at First NLR. Our goal is for you to be a lifelong follower of Jesus. And I pray that the Lord would bless and guide you as you obediently follow what He has for you and your family. We look forward to connecting with you.